Chapter Nine of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Phantom Horse. A deputation from the Union Shearers waited upon Edward Bryce and headed by Tom Dow as spokesman endeavoured to induce him to sign the agreement and thus make Munda a Union Shed. Edward Bryce declined to retreat from the position he had taken up and intimated he should start with non-union men if the others decided not to accept his terms. Tom Dow tried to quiet the men, but angry threats were uttered as they moved away, and Edward Bryce was convinced there would be trouble. He was almost sorry his sister and Flora had come to Munda. There was no telling what these men might do, or into what excesses they would be led. There was nothing for it but to abide the result. Riots had occurred on one or two stations, and the government had offered to send police to Munda to enforce order and protect property. Meanwhile, they were a merry household at Munda, and Mrs. O'Brien protested that Miss Ida had turned the homestead upside down. "'You said you would tell me about the phantom horse,' said Wyndham Hanworth to Ted, as they were all seated on the veranda one night after dinner. "'Perhaps it would not interest the ladies,' said Ted. "'I should very much like to hear about a phantom horse,' said Flora, and Ida said she had almost forgotten the story, so it would be interesting to hear it again. "'It would be a good subject for a picture,' said Ida to Wyndham. "'The title is catching,' replied the artist. "'When I hear the story, I shall be able to form a better idea as to whether it will make up into a good picture.' "'There are several versions of the Phantom Horse story,' said Edward Bryce. "'But I think the one I shall tell you is true.' Nine or ten years ago,' said Ted, "'one of our boundary riders came in with an extraordinary story. "'He had been out as usual and returned home rather late. "'He was tired, and so was his horse, "'and they were making slow progress towards his hut. "'Suddenly the man fancied he heard a sound "'like horses galloping at a furious pace.' He listened intently, and became certain the rumble was caused by horses. He looked round, but could see nothing. It was open country where he was, but a couple of miles beyond him it was well wooded, and the ground became more broken and hilly. He was at a loss to know where the horses had come from, for the bulk of the mares were fourteen or fifteen miles away. "'You must know,' said Ted, "'that a horse of this description will entice mares away, and gallop off with them to his lair.' wherever it may be. This goes to show the wonderful power the male has over the female, he added, with a glance at his sister. Indeed, said Ida, this is the first I've heard of it. At all events, the phantom horse has exercised wonderful power over mares on Munda Station during the past ten years. The boundary rider was not long before he saw, galloping in his direction, half a dozen horses. In front he saw a fine, powerful grey horse, and he knew he had never seen him before. He rubbed his eyes, fancying he must have been deceived, but no, there plain enough was the horse, and he looked almost white. As they drew nearer to him, the leader caught sight of the boundary rider, and at once changed his course, and the man then saw there were five blood mares belonging to Munda after him. He knew, in the tired condition his horse was in, it was hopeless to give chase, and he determined to ride on to his hut, and then early in the morning to take another man with him, and go in search of the horse and mares. Next morning he related to old Wideawake what he had seen. "'Has Wideawake been here ten years?' said Ida. "'Off and on he has,' said Ted. "'He went away for a couple of years, but came back again. "'At all events, he was here at the time I speak of, for he accompanied the boundary rider,' whose name I forget, in his search after the white horse. Wide Awake has told me more than once the story of that ride. I remember when a lad how excited I got over his recital. He can tell the story much better than I can, but I'm afraid he is not in a fit state to appear before ladies this evening. So you must accept me in his place. What is the matter with him? asked Ida. I hope he's not met with an accident. Nothing serious said Ted, with a wink at Wyndham. He ran against some obstruction last night, and hurt his eye. But to my story, 
wide awake and his mate were mounted on two of the fastest horses at munda and they had no fear of not being able to head the runaways provided they came across them they followed for several miles in the direction the horses had gone the previous night and soon found traces of them as the ground was moist wide awake however discovered they were on the wrong track for the horses had doubled and gone back again they rode back and found marks on the right which had been newly made they were now in a country but little known to the station hands and boundary riders as they rode on the growth became more dense but there seemed to be a regular track made by horses constantly passing along wide awake was in front when all at once an extraordinary sight was before him looking down at the track formed between the growth of stunted trees and wild tangle of underwood he saw an open space green and cool evidently a choice plot of pasture in the midst of all this forest standing under the shade of a large tree was a fine grey blood horse and around him were five mares wide awake recognised as belonging to the station the grey horse he had never seen before where has such a splendid animal sprung from for wide awake could see at a glance he was a prince among stallions the two men halted and looked at the group under the tree and various were their surmises as to where the grey had come from the wind was blowing slightly in the direction of the horses and presently wide awake saw the grey lift his head sniff the air and then commence to paw the ground the horse had scented danger and from his movements it was evident that he was accustomed to it and knew how to act he neighed loudly and this at once secured a response from the horses hidden in the bush no sooner did the grey hear the answering neigh than he snorted defiance made a snap at the mares then headed them and led the way at a smart gallop from this the men concluded there was an outlet at the other side of the open space without further delay they pressed forward and were soon in the open ground at the far end to their left they saw the last of the mares disappearing they at once gave chase it was a wild ride it is well known that horses ridden by good men can generally head a horse with no burden on his back it may seem strange but it is true i have seen a horse get rid of his rider over hurdles and go on leading the field for perhaps half a mile but at the end of the journey he came in last across the open they galloped and passing again through a narrow opening came out into clear country in a very short time in front about half a mile ahead were the horses the grey still leading they imagined it would be an easy matter to overtake them after an hour or so hard galloping they were vastly mistaken the grey horse led them a merry dance mile after mile passed and still the horses were well ahead at last a couple of the mares commenced to flag the grey noticed their signs of distress but dare not slacken his pace one black mare galloped alongside him and wide awake noticed the horse seemed to encourage her and urge her on two mares fell back beaten and the men passed them another mile and a third dropped out and then a fourth but the black mare still continued to gallop with the horse on they went and wide awake says he never had such an exciting chase before or since nearer and nearer they drew to the galloping pair they were almost on to them when the grey horse as though realising the mare could go no faster suddenly shot forward and left her behind the speed at which the grey went after all these miles wide awake says was astonishing they raced after him but soon found it was all to no purpose instead of gaining upon the grey he was leaving them and they could feel their horses had gone far enough at last they were compelled to halt and no sooner had they done so than the grey slackened his pace and finally stopping wheeled round and looked at them shaking his head in defiance it was no use following him then so they turned their horses round and went back after the mares they found them all thoroughly knocked up and had not much difficulty in driving them home to the nearest paddock both wide awake and his mate were tired out and the former slept in the boundary rider's hut next morning wide awake came on to munda and told his story scores of times since then 
the phantom horse as we call him has led the best horses and riders in the country many a long stern chase in ten years no one has ever been able to capture him or even head him and it is impossible to corner him where the horse came from is a mystery and will remain so it is said however that he is an imported stallion that was stolen from one of the stations and it is supposed he got away from the thieves galloped into the dense country and was never caught again how he came to munda district i do not know certain it is he was not seen here until ten years ago he is now almost white and must be fifteen or sixteen years old but he can still gallop like the wind on a moonlight night he can sometimes be seen near the paddocks and being white he has a strange weird look about him that has caused the men to christen him the phantom horse he is very particular in his choice and always selects the best mares to run off with that youngster i pointed out to you last night is a young phantom all his stock can gallop and we conclude from this he must be very well bred he will never be caught of that i am certain we could shoot him of course but his stock turn out so well we do not mind him running away with some of our best mares occasionally oh ted do let us have a gallop after him said ida who was a very good horsewoman would you like it flora i know you can ride what give chase to a phantom said wyndham yes said ida it will be glorious do let us try and get a peep at him i've never seen him it is rather risky work said ted bryce but if wyn and flora think they can manage the ride i shall be only too pleased for you all to have a gallop mind it will be a genuine gallop for the phantom seems to magnetise the horses chasing him and draw them on we can take wide awake with us and young law who's a first-rate lad on a horse can wide awake ride well enough now said ida is he not too old if you knew what wide awake can do you would be astonished said her brother he is a wiry middle-aged active man and ten years younger than he looks i should say wyndham hanworth and his sister were both good in the saddle it was their one extravagance so the artist said he was a thorough believer in horse exercise and argued that in the end it was more economical and much pleasanter than paying a doctor then we'll go to-morrow said ted bryce wide awake can see as much with one eye as most people can with two so his damaged optic need not stand in the way i will give orders to have the horses ready as we must make an early start we have to find the phantom before we can chase him End of chapter nine chapter ten of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain a rattling gallop wide awake selected the best horses at munda for the ride after the phantom as he knew they would be required they were all well bred and the pair on which ida and flora were mounted were sired by the horse they were about to seek what a beauty said ida as she stroked the arched neck of the bay on which he was seated he does not much resemble his sire in colour now said her brother but he has inherited his galloping powers and it takes a good one to beat him flora's mount was a wiry well-set horse but had not the spirit of ida's bay ted bryce knew what a good rider his sister was but he thought flora could hardly manage such a spirited animal his own horse was the one he generally rode at munda a thoroughbred and fast enough for any run wyndham hanworth was well pleased with his mount and before the chase that followed was over he had good reason to be thankful his horse was a clinker wide awake and young hiram law went with them and they all rode out of the homestead enclosure in high spirits the day was not too hot although the sun was shining brilliantly wide awake led the way and he said he thought he knew in which direction the phantom could be found as three of the mares were out with him a smart gallop across a level even paddock put the party on good terms with themselves this is splendid said flora who was riding alongside edward bryce ida being ahead with wyndham hanworth nothing like a smart gallop for invigorating one said ted it has brought the colour into your cheeks you are looking much better than when you arrived at manda 
the change will do you a lot of good it was very kind of you to let us come to munda she replied i hardly knew what to say when ida broached the subject i thought mrs bryce would object which no doubt she did said ted i dare say she thought it a terrible thing for two young ladies to pay a visit to two bachelors at munda were you glad to come he asked earnestly oh yes said flora frankly then checking herself added you know i never care to be separated from my brother for very long i flatter myself i am useful to him and that he misses me i'm sure he does said ted i know he was very pleased to hear you were coming he seems to get on very well with ida look at them now how earnestly they are talking he admires ida very much said flora she is a lovable girl and so high-spirited she puts me in the shade utterly that i am sure she does not said ted looking at her admiringly flora hanworth was charming in her habit and with a small hard hat sitting jauntily on her well-shaped head ted bryce thought he had never seen her look so well there was not much time for conversation as wide awake hinted they must push forward after a ten miles ride they commenced to leave the level plains and to enter the broken country keeping a keen lookout wide awake soon saw traces of the horses they were in search of he requested wyndham hanworth and ida to bear to the left with hiram law as guide while he went on with edward bryce and flora we can meet at a certain point i've arranged with law he said and then once in front of the phantom he will probably make for the open and we shall have a rattling gallop after him this was considered the best plan and the party separated to meet as wide awake had appointed in about an hour they came together again and wide awake pointing ahead said there's the phantom and the mares are with him they looked in the direction indicated and there sure enough about a mile away was the grey horse and three mares quietly cropping the grass unaware danger was at hand the best thing we can do is gallop straight for them said wide awake and they will then make for the open they set their horses in motion and quickly broke into a gallop when about half way across the open the phantom saw them and as though realising there was no time to be lost he turned quickly and galloped away with the mares bravo shouted ted he's making straight for the plain we shall have a grand gallop after him this beats fox hunting i guess come along girls now then win let us see what our horses are made of away they went with wide awake and hiram law leading the ground was rough but the bush-bred horses thought nothing of it and flora considered it marvellous how they avoided the numerous holes and rocks that lay almost directly in their track we're in for a jump said ted as he saw wide awake and law set their horses at a huge fallen tree that lay right across their track all right shouted wyndham we'll take it together flora shouted ida follow the leaders it was not a formidable jump but it was the first that day and consequently increased the excitement of the gallop they all got safely over and ida's bay gave a tremendous leap but she sat firm as a rock and did not move in her saddle in front they could see the phantom leading the mares and flora thought of edward bryce's story the previous night and how much it resembled the reality dashing through the bushwood they were not long in reaching level open ground and then the chase commenced in earnest the phantom horse seemed to know he would have to do his best and the mares as usual soon found it impossible to keep pace with him they fell back and were soon passed by the riders who took but little notice of them so intent were they on the white spot dancing in front of them and gradually drawing ahead we shall never catch him said ida what a galloper he is this is something like a run the draghounds are very tame after this it is the first time i've ever hunted a wild horse said wyndham i confess i relish the sensation he's gaining on us wide awake shouted ted bryce push on or he'll lose us we cannot go much faster replied wide awake i can said ted excitedly and shouted to those behind him come along follow me we'll try and head him be careful ladies sang out young law as they dashed past him the ground is tricky farther on 
We'll be careful, said Ida. Follow us. This was quite sufficient for Hiram Law. He was a lightweight, and his horse hardly felt his burden. I'm off, wide awake, he shouted. Miss Ida told me to follow her. Keep your eyes on em, sang out Wide Awake, who was now in the rear. Ted Bryce and Wyndham were racing neck and neck, and Ida and Flora were close behind. Their blood was up, and the excitement of the riders acted on their horses. It was a glorious gallop. There was no time to speak, very little time to think. Ted Bryce urged his horse on, and almost forgot the others were behind him. The phantom horse could now be plainly seen. The gap between him and the riders had lessened. His splendid action and great stride excited Ted's admiration. I'll head you yet, he thought. It will be something worth talking about if I can beat the phantom in a race. He looked back and saw the others were not far behind. On they went, and mile after mile was left behind and still the phantom held out no signs of distress. The thunder of the horse's hoofs resounded on the hard ground, but it was not long before they were in a country where the earth was loose and resembled a rabbit warren full of holes and pitfalls. Ted's horse stumbled once or twice, but after finding out the nature of the ground, he picked his way in a very clever manner. The phantom galloped on, and Ted saw with delight they were gaining on him, the horse was evidently out of his usual country, and did not know the ground well. In a few minutes there was a cloud of dust ahead, a white horse struggling on the ground, and Ted knew the phantom had fallen. "'Come along!' he shouted excitedly. "'He's down! We'll catch him now!' Ida Bryce urged her horse forward, and Flora followed her closely. Hiram Law was galloping alongside Wyndham Hanworth. Mr. Bryce will be down if he don't be careful, said the lad. I know this ground. It's nasty. I've never heard of the phantom coming down before. If he falls, there's not much chance for us. Hiram had hardly got the words out of his mouth when his horse came down with a bang onto his nose and the lad shot over his head, turning a complete somersault and landing on his back. Ida laughed merrily as she saw him scramble to his feet. The phantom horse was on his feet again, and galloped on, none the worse for his fall. Ted Bryce and Wyndham had gained on him considerably, and their hopes of heading him were high. Another mile, and Ted Bryce was within a dozen yards of the hitherto unbeaten grey. The phantom horse snorted savagely, but galloped on. Nearer and nearer Ted Bryce drew to him, and his nerves tingled with excitement. Now his horse was almost level with the phantom, and Ida called out, Ted's got him, Flora. Look, look, he's nearly level. The phantom's beaten at last. But if beaten, the phantom did not mean to be trapped. Without any warning, the grey horse suddenly swerved round to the left and rushed right across the track of Edward Bryce's horse. The move was so sudden that Ted Bryce had no time to check his mount. His horse, startled at this change of tactics, got out of his stride, crossed his forelegs, and came down heavily. Ted Bryce was unhurt. He scrambled to his feet, still holding his horse's bridle, and then looked round for the phantom. The grey horse, checked in his course by the other riders, for a moment stood at bay. It was at this instant Ted Bryce got on his feet. Then he saw the phantom make a savage rush at Flora Hanworth, who sat on her horse a little to the right of the others. Ted Bryce gave a loud cry of alarm. Flora Hanworth saw the savage animal rushing on to her, and was too confused to attempt to move her horse. In another moment, Flora and her horse were knocked over by the phantom, and the grey was lashing out furiously at them with his heels. "'My God, she'll be killed!' shouted Ted Bryce, dropping the reins of his horse and rushing to the spot. Flora was rendered insensible by the fall, but was luckily thrown out of the saddle. Hiram Law and Wyndham were there before him, and the phantom, seeing them, galloped off at a furious pace. Wide Awake, coming up at the time, caught Ted Bryce's horse and led him up to the spot. Ted Bryce rushed to Flora and dragged her out of harm's way, 
he knelt down and raising her supported her body her head drooped and he saw she was insensible she's fainted win he said i hope to god she's not injured i shall never forgive myself if she's come to any harm wyndham hanworth and ida bryce had dismounted and now stood about the prostrate girl she's stunned with the fall said wide awake flora was not long before she opened her eyes and saw edward bryce bending over her the look in his eyes startled her and the colour came into her cheeks he bent over her and said softly are you much hurt flora tell me you're not injured he called her flora and she felt a delicious sense of happiness steal over her i am all right she said quietly i was stunned by the fall my head pains me but that is all luckily flora hanworth had received no severe injuries she was bruised and shaken but managed to ride to munda although the journey was tedious edward bryce was heartily glad when they reached the homestead and flora was at once put in charge of mrs o'brien who ordered her to bed and attended on her as well as a mother and doctor combined would have done she'll be all right in the morning master edward said mrs o'brien in answer to his anxious inquiry thank heaven for that he said mrs o'brien looked after him and shook her head it comes to em all sooner or later she said to herself well she's a bonny girl and i'm sure she loves him i can see it in her eyes when i mention his name End of chapter ten chapter eleven of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain trouble brewing flora hanworth quickly recovered from the shock caused by her fall the next day she was up for dinner and although pale said she felt no ill effects you had a narrow escape said ted the phantom was desperate i was afraid he would kick you it was an anxious moment for me flora was i indeed in danger she asked yes replied ted if you had been seriously injured i don't know what i should have done it was evident both to ida bryce and wyndham hanworth that this incident had drawn flora and edward bryce closer together ida was pleased she would gladly welcome flora as a sister our first batch of non-union shearers arrived from sydney to-day said ted to wyndham i expect the union men will induce them to join their camp at any rate the bulk of them that will be hard lines said wyndham when you've gone to the expense of bringing them up that counts for nothing said ted if persuasion has no effect the union men will resort to force it will not be the first time they've done so here it was as edward bryce anticipated twenty or thirty men who had undertaken to shear at munda and had been forwarded from sydney when they reached the station were induced to join the union camp the other ten declined and in consequence came in for torrents of abuse and were lucky to get off with that wide awake heard the next lot of men were to be taken by force into the union camp if they would not go voluntarily fifteen police had been sent to munda to keep order edward bryce would have preferred to do without them if possible but he knew it would be unsafe not to have some protection with such a large camp of men on the spot the river darling was still navigable and ted had entered into arrangements with the captain of one of the cargo boats to bring the men down during the night as cargo boats were not allowed to travel downstream at night he thought the union picket men would be off their guard the captain of the boat brought twenty men safely down but unfortunately he misunderstood his directions and landed them at the wrong place more than an hour was lost before the munda men and the police came across them and by this time it was light and the unionists were astir there was no help for it but to march for the sheds as quickly as possible and avoid an encounter with the union men all went well until the camp was roused the unionist pickets saw the men marching to munda and at once gave the signal to the men in the camp the unionists turned out in a body about a hundred strong and most of the men had formidable looking weapons in the shape of heavy sticks in their hands the munda men were surrounded by their escort of police 
led by Sergeant Tyler, an old hand in the force. The Unionists were taken aback at the strong protection afforded the men, but they passed on and intercepted the line of march. Sergeant Tyler rode forward and requested them to allow the men to proceed peaceably to Munda, but he was answered by angry shouts and a great flourishing of sticks. Tom Dow came forward and asked to be allowed to confer with the men on their way to Munda. Sergeant Tyler declined to allow him to do so, but Edward Bryce, riding up, said, Let him speak to the men, Tyler. I want no man to work for me who is unwilling to do so. He then rode back to the men, before Tom Dow came up. The union leader wishes to speak to you. Sergeant Tyler refused to grant him permission until I asked that he might be allowed to do so. Listen to me, men. You have been engaged in Sydney and brought here at my expense. Your wages are fixed. They are at the same rate as those demanded by the union men. I want no man to shear for me without adequate pay. But I refuse to be bound hand and foot by any agreement these union men think fit to draw up. If I sign it this year, there is no telling what they may demand next year. Here is Tom Dow. I will do his work. If there is a man among you who wishes to join the union camp and leave me in the lurch, let him step out. I want no unwilling men in my shed. A cheer went up from the men at this manly speech, and then a shout of, We'll stand by you, Mr. Bryce, to a man. You've taken the wind out of my sails, said Tom Dow with a smile. May I speak to them? Certainly, said Ted Bryce, and turning to the men he said, Dow wishes to say a few words to you. I have no fear what your answer will be. Another cheer from the men, and then Tom Dow said, Fellow workers, the union camp is formed here. We are all ready and willing to commence work at Manda. But, for our own protection, we ask Mr. Bryce to sign our agreement and shear under it. He refuses to do so. We are standing up for our rights. The masters have it all their own way. We merely want justice. Will you fight against your fellow workmen? Join our camp and stand firm, and Mr. Bryce will then see it's to his interest to do as we ask. We demand nothing but what is just and fair. Manda is a test shed, and our victory here would help the men who are standing up for their rights in other parts of the colony. Men, do not join the blacklegs and injure your own cause. Come out in a body and go over to the union camp. What do you say, men? asked one of the newcomers, a tall, powerful man, evidently superior to the others. Shall we throw up Mr. Bryce and join the union camp, or shall we stick to the agreement we signed in Sydney to shear at Munda? We'll stick to our agreement, Ben Holt, shouted the men. You've heard their answer, said the man called Ben Holt to Tom Dow. I'm sorry for it, said Dow. Consider well what you're doing. You're siding with capital against labour. We're doing nothing of the sort, said Ben Holt. We mean to have a free hand in the choice of our work. We're not going to be ordered about by a lot of fellows like you. Bah, you're worse than the masters of long chalk. Then you decline to join us, said Tom Dow. We do, replied Ben Holt. You see those men, Sergeant Tyler, said Tom Dow, pointing to the formidable body of shearers. They are determined to stick up for their rights. I cannot control them if they wish to prevent these men working at the shed. That means you will not try to control them, replied the sergeant. Remember, Tom Dow, my men are armed. I am sent here to protect these men Mr. Bryce has engaged. If your men attempt to interfere with me in the execution of my duty, you will know what to expect. Then you mean to fire on us, said Tom Dow angrily. This is what we are taxed for to pay men to shoot us down. A nice government we've got, and no mistake. Keep a civil tongue in your head, Tom Dow, said the sergeant, or you may get into trouble. Tom Dow went back to the unionists and told them the men had declined to join the camp. Then we'll make em join, shouted some score of angry voices. None but union men shall shear in that shed. Sergeant Tyler, with Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, moved on in front, the escort following. They look a threatening lot of men, said Tyler, but I doubt if they'll do much. I've seen a lot of them in my time, and there's not much danger in them. You see, Wyn, there will be a row after all, said Ted Bryce. Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to keep as far from the Unionists as possible, 
and to do nothing to provoke an encounter. He had also given strict orders that no matter what the Unionists did, the police were not to make any attack until he gave the word. They were marching past the Union men, when suddenly a shower of stones came pelting onto them. Luckily the missiles fell wide of their mark, and none of the stones did any damage. Sergeant Tyler gave no sign. He coolly rode on as if nothing had happened. The men under escort did not relish the position they were in. "'Why don't you pepper em with the guns?' shouted one man. The Unionists, seeing no notice was taken of their first attack, grew bolder and made a movement to intercept the line of march. Sergeant Tyler, with Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, rode on. In front of the men, the sergeant halted. "'I'm going to take these men to Munda,' he said, quietly but firmly. "'My men have their rifles loaded. If you continue to obstruct us, I shall order them to fire. If I give an order to fire, some of you will not have a chance of shearing again under any conditions. Take my advice and return to your camp before any mischief is done. There is a heavy punishment for rioters.' "'Let the black legs go,' said Tom Dow. "'We may have a chance of paying them out later on. "'That is a threat, Dow. "'I shall not forget it if any of these men are attacked "'during their stay at Munda,' said Tyler. "'The Unionists did not stir, "'and Sergeant Tyler ordered his men to move to the left "'to prevent an encounter. "'No sooner was this done than the Union men also moved to the left "'and again brought them to a halt. "'I will give you one more chance,' said Tyler. Let my men pass on, and nothing more shall be said about it. A sullen murmur from the mass of men was the only response. You will not give orders to fire on them? asked Ted Bryce. No, said the sergeant. I can manage this business without that. Clear the way, he shouted, but the unionists did not move. Force a passage, he said to his men. Use your batons only. The police were mounted on strong, powerful horses and at once rode forward, still surrounding the men they were escorting. The horses trampled on the feet of the foremost of the Unionists. Several men seized the bridles of the horses, but sharp blows on the hands made them relax their hold. "'Look out, Tyler!' shouted Ted Bryce as he ducked to avoid a stone. Sergeant Tyler could not move his horse quick enough, and a sharp stone hit him on the wrist, drawing blood. He rode his horse forward, and drove the Unionists along in front of him. The police quickly forced a passage, and then from the rear came another shower of stones. Three of the shearers were knocked down, and one of the policemen fell from his horse, stunned by a blow on the head. Wyndham Hanworth felt a stinging sensation in his right knee, and looking down saw his breeches were cut and his knee bleeding. A slight scratch, said Wyndham, in answer to Ted. Nothing more. The blackguards, said Ted. I did not think they would go so far. Sergeant Tyler ordered six of his men to form a guard in the rear, while the remainder, with Ted Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth, escorted the men to the homestead buildings. Tyler, with his half-dozen men, charged at the crowd, and laying about them freely, soon dispersed them. The Unionists, however, still kept up a fire of stones as the police retired again. The constable who had been knocked from his horse quickly recovered and remounted. He had a nasty bump on his forehead. Seeing the police were determined, and fancying they might use their firearms if further provoked, the Unionists retired to their camp. They were not satisfied with what they had done, and several of the worst men hinted at firing the shed and the homestead if Edward Bryce did not come to terms. "'We've not done with those fellows yet,' said Sergeant Tyler to Edward Bryce. "'We shall make a start tomorrow," said Ted. "'And perhaps when the men see I'm determined to do without them, they will cave in.' "'I hope so,' said Tyler. "'But I doubt it. There are a lot of loafing scoundrels in the camp. These men are the bane of the regular shearers.' The men injured in the attack were attended to, and their wounds were not of a serious nature. "'You had better not go far from the homestead, Ida, while these men are about.' said Ted to his sister. They would not interfere with us, surely, said Ida. I do not think they attack women. There's no telling what they may do in their present frame of mind, said Ted. 
Perhaps it would be safer to send you and Flora back to Sydney. I'll talk the matter over with Wynne. Do not be alarmed about us, Ted, said Ida. We are not timid girls. There is no occasion to pack us off to Sydney. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the Shed. The shearing shed was several miles from the homestead at Munda, lower down the river. A collection of buildings was built, consisting of overseer's cottage, stores, and various huts, also a wool shed and a wool scouring plant. The wool shed was a building one hundred and thirty feet long, and built of colonial pine framework on piles two and a half feet from the ground. The building was enclosed with galvanised corrugated iron. Between the sweating pen and the wool sorter's quarters was the shearer's portion of the shed, which is called the board. On either side of this board, fifteen shearers are placed. The catching pens are fixed between them, into which the sheep are put from the sweating pen. Each pen has an opening onto the board, and two shearers are supplied from each pen. A passage called a race runs down the centre of the building, the catching pens being on either side, and a gate opens from each pen into the race. The race is always kept filled with sheep from the sweating pen, and, as the catching pens become empty, they are filled from the race. Machines were used in the Munda shed, and each shearer had two machines and a separate driving gear fitted with a brake, which permitted the shearer to stop or start his machine at will. Briefly, this was how the shed looked at Munda when the roll was called. Sheep in large numbers could be seen on all sides in the race, the catching and sweating pens all ready for an immediate start. Forty men answered when the roll was called and signed their names. "'Before you start,' said Edward Bryce, "'it is hardly necessary for me to tell you "'we may have some more trouble with the men in camp. "'We shall do all in our power to protect you from being molested, "'and I expect you to help us by keeping within bounds "'and not go straying near the camp. "'We have a hundred and thirty thousand sheep to shear, I anticipate, "'and I trust you will be able to get through the work as quickly as possible.' "'The men gave a cheer, and at once proceeded to take their places on the board.' It was an animated scene, and Wyndham Hanworth had already commenced to make sketches of the novel sights before him. Flora Hanworth and Ida Bryce had ridden over from the homestead to see the start, and were much interested in it. The union men assembled to see what would happen, and as none of them would sign the agreement under which Munda Station was run, they were ordered off the premises. The police were drawn up outside the shed, and under Tom Dow's instruction, the Unionists quietly walked back to their camp, which was about a quarter of a mile below the wool shed on the public roadway. The Union camp was now in full working order, and the number of men in it increased daily. Pickets in squads of four were formed, armed with heavy waddies made from saplings. These pickets were ordered to bring into camp any men found making their way to the wool shed. Only ten men had come over from the Union camp to join in the shearing, and these deserters, as they were called, would have had a warm reception if the Unionists had captured them. Inside the shed, all was bustle and excitement for an hour or two, but the men quickly settled down to their work, and it was surprising the rate at which some of them shore the sheep. All classes of men were represented on the board. "'They're a miscellaneous lot,' said Ted, laughing, and judging from their movements, I imagine sheep shearing is new work to them. However, they generally do their best, and the sheep do not suffer much. You see the fifth man on the right, Win. Yes, said Wyndham. He does not seem very easy at his work. He was a trainer in Sydney, said Ted. He's a good sort of fellow, had bad luck, and could get nothing to do in his line. He applied to a friend of mine, who said he was sure I would give him a chance, and so packed him off up here. If he can't manage the shearing, I'll give him a chance with a horse or two here. What on earth can a trainer know about shearing? asked Wyndham. Fraser, that is the man's name, told my friend he had shorn sheep before, but it must have been a good many years ago, long before machines were invented. 
Look at him now. He's having a struggle with that sheep. Why, he's cut himself. I'll stop him and give him a chance elsewhere, said Ted. Sam Fraser was nothing loath to leave his place on the board. He had come in for plenty of chaff during the short time he had been doing his best to shear. "'You'll never make a fortune at that game, Fraser,' said Ted Bryce. "'I think horses are more in your line than sheep.' Sam Fraser gave a comical smile as he bound up his hand and said, "'It's a good many years since I handled a sheep, Mr Bryce. "'There were no machines, then. "'I can handle a horse, though, with any man when I get a chance. "'My luck's been dead out, or I should not be here, trying to shear. "'I'll give you a chance with a horse or two I have,' said Ted. "'In the meantime, you can either look on or go outside.' "'Thank you, Mr Bryce,' said Fraser. "'I'll do my very best for you.' "'Some of the men shear well,' said Ted, "'for a scratch lot.' "'They do not trouble much about their clothes,' said Wyndham. "'Most of the shearers had moleskin pants on "'and a flannel singlet with no overshirt, "'and socks were discarded, many of them being barefooted, "'although here and there a man had a rough pair of shoes "'made out of a piece of bagging or wool-pack "'with string for laces. "'It will make an excellent picture,' said Wyndham, "'if I can manage to do it justice.' "'I must be very careful about the sheep this time,' he added, laughing. "'You have not forgotten that incident,' said Ted Bryce. "'I consider the remarks I made on your picture were well-timed, "'for it was through my attempt at criticism we became known to each other. "'I expect your sheep this time, Mr Hanworth, will be so lifelike, "'we shall feel inclined to sit and look at them, just to see if they move,' said Ida. "'I hardly think I shall carry the deception so far,' said the artist with a smile. "'but I shall try my best to make the picture a success.' "'Shearing was going on briskly "'when the men were knocked off at eight for breakfast "'and resumed work an hour later. "'I think we may as well ride back,' said Ted Bryce. "'I'm hungry. I don't know how you all feel.' "'The keen demands of appetite are upon me,' said Ida. "'It was early when we left Munda.' "'About five o'clock,' said Ted. "'I wonder what the Sydney ladies would say to that.' "'I expect Mrs. Bryce would be very shocked "'if she heard you were galloping around the country "'at such an unearthly hour in the morning.' "'Shearing went on all right in the shed for two or three days, "'and the Unionists made no move, "'although they were still camps on the same spot. "'The shearers occupied a hut built of pine slabs with an iron roof. "'The shed hands, called rouseabouts, had a building to themselves, "'and also the wool scourers.' The men were lively in their huts at night, and passed the time away merrily. The Unionists could hear them singing and dancing, and were in an ill humour, because the shearing appeared to be going on very well without them. Tom Dow had great difficulty in keeping them in order, and he felt they would break out before long. Ever since the night Wide Awake had fought and beaten him, Bully Spence had been eager for revenge. Spence had his followers still, and he was a dangerous man, a regular firebrand in such a mixed community. Eli Spence sneered at Tom Dow, and characterised him as a weak-hearted man, afraid to show what the Unionists were made of. A couple of nights after shearing had commenced, Eli Spence was the centre of a group of a dozen men. He was speaking to them earnestly, and Tom Dow knew he was up to no good. He moved towards the group, and Eli Spence did not see him. He heard Spence say, Ah, for strong measures, if we can't get at the shed, there's the homestead. All the police are down here at the wool shed. They'll never think of a raid being made on the homestead. There's some rare fun to be had up there, said Eli, with a savage grin. There's a couple of nice-looking girls there, and if we capture them, I reckon Mr. Edward Bryce would quickly come to terms with us then. You're a fool, Eli Spence said Tom Dow. I warn you again not to mention these things. I will have no acts of incendiarism here while I am in charge of the camp. Such acts of violence injure our cause. If we must fight, let us fight fair. Bravo, Tom! shouted several men. Do the masters fight fair? shouted Eli Spence. Some of their men do. What about Wide Awake? said a man. There was a loud laugh at Spence's expense and the hit went home. "'I said the masters do not fight fair,' roared Eli Spence. 
we can't get our rights by fair means let's get em by foul say i we're a hundred and fifty strong here now and we all sit down like a lot of blessed sheep and let these non-union fellows take our places we could get possession of that shed in half an hour if we were all of one mind tom dow saw eli spence's words had some effect on the men he tried to counteract them by urging the men not to commit any acts that would bring them within the clutches of the law when the lights were put out eli spence and a few of the more desperate men in the camp were plotting how they could best make an attack on the homestead with success we ought to fire the place said eli there'll be no lives lost you need have no fear of that they'll all be able to get out before there's any danger but once the place is fired it will burn to the ground nothing can save it that will show we mean business at any rate i'd sooner see the wool shed fired said one man that would do the most damage can't it be done eli could be done but there's a greater risk of being caught police are always on a look out there while the homestead is unguarded i'm for burning the homestead as it can be done easily said eli spence these scoundrels talked for a couple of hours before they turned in and it was eventually decided if tom dow still remained inactive they should take the matter into their own hands these men were not regular shearers all of them with the exception of eli spence had joined the camp only a short time they were men who professed to be staunch unionists but were unmitigated loafers anxious to gain admission to the camp in order to idle away their time and be fed at the expense of the union it was these men who did the unionist cause so much harm tom dow knew what these men were but he had no means of getting rid of them if he ordered them out of the camp and they went to the wool shed and offered to be taken on he knew he would be blamed for it to order them out of the camp would be a dangerous experiment it was a difficult position for tom dow to be placed in he did not believe in open acts of violence but he saw no chance of averting them if he warned edward bryce his warning would probably be construed into a threat by sergeant tyler he determined to watch eli spence and his mates closely and by timely interference try and prevent them from damaging edward bryce's property and at the same time doing incalculable injury to the union cause tom dow was a thorough believer in the justice of his cause he was bound up in unionism his was a narrow mind and like many men of his class he was full of prejudices according to his lights he acted as he thought right but there is no more dangerous man than he who becomes a fanatic believing in the justice of his cause such a man is not open to conviction tom dow was such a man and he placed the cause he advocated before everything End of chapter twelve Chapter thirteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Herbert Golding, MLA. It is necessary for the continuance of the story that Munda Station should be left for a brief period, in order to ascertain how affairs had progressed in Sydney since the departure of Ida Bryce and Flora Hanworth. Herbert Golding acted the modest man after his election to the Assembly. Deputations waited upon him to congratulate him upon his success, and he modestly disclaimed any merits of his own contributing to it, and alluded to his late partner's popularity as being mainly responsible for his election. At a general meeting of the investors and depositors in the Amalgamated Land and Investment etc. company, when Herbert Golding took the chair, he was received with loud cheers the statement he made to the meeting still further enhanced his popularity he gave a glowing account of the prosperity of the company and said the directors declared a dividend of ten per cent and carried over several thousands to the reserve fund all depositors would receive ten per cent on deposits and the chairman stated that the interest would be paid at the offices on a certain date it was a large meeting, 
and there was not a dissentient voice raised against the policy of the directors. When people receive ten per cent for money on deposit, they seldom give a thought as to how such a large percentage can be paid. It was so in this case, and Herbert Golding's statement was continually interrupted by cheers. After the meeting, the majority of those present remained behind. Herbert Golding had an idea this gathering had something to do with himself, so he lingered about the offices to hear the news. The preliminaries had evidently been settled before. In a very short time, a messenger was dispatched to see if Mr. Golding had left the building. Fortunately, he had not done so. He had not the slightest intention of doing so, until he knew what had taken place upstairs in the boardroom. When he entered the room, there was again much cheering. One of the directors said he had been deputed on behalf of the shareholders and depositors to ask Mr. Golding to accept a slight offering from them as an acknowledgement of the excellent services he had rendered the company as chairman of directors, and also at the same time to celebrate his election as member for Balmain East. The subscribers wished to know if Mr. Golding would consent to sit for his portrait to be painted by that rising young artist, Wyndham Hanworth, whose ability was beyond question, and who would be sure to do justice to his subject. When Herbert Golding heard who was to paint the portrait, a strange feeling of uneasiness crept over him. Why, he could not tell. He had no cause to dread Wyndham Hanworth painting him. He had only met the artist once or twice at the Bryce's. He knew Mr. Hanworth was a great friend of Edward Bryce, and he also knew the artist selected was the best man they could have chosen. Herbert Golding did not like the idea of Wyndham Hanworth painting his portrait, but he was not the man to raise objections in a case of this kind. He thanked those present in feeling terms for the honour done him, and expressed the pleasure it would give him to sit to Mr. Hanworth who was an artist of recognised ability, and with whom he had a slight acquaintance. When Herbert Golding left the offices of Amalgamated Land and Investment Company, he took a hansom and drove to Mrs. Bryce's residence. He found her at home, and she welcomed him cordially. Herbert Golding was always well received by Mrs. Bryce. His constant visits since the death of her husband had caused people to talk, but as he was one of the executors of Mrs. Bryce's will, excuses were made for his presence at her house. He was not in love with Mrs. Bryce, although he had no doubt she would accept him, if he offered her his hand, as soon as decency permitted. He was too selfish to think of anyone but himself, and it was self-interest prompted him to encourage Mrs. Bryce, in the belief that he loved her. She had fifty thousand pounds, a fine residence, and was not a bad-looking woman into the bargain. The fifty thousand pounds Herbert Golding knew would be very useful to him at the present time. It certainly was a nuisance, he thought, that this sum of money should be mortgaged heavily in the person of Mrs. Bryce, but as he could not obtain the money without the lady, he resigned himself to accept both. Why should a man situated as Herbert Golding be in want of money? He was a partner in one of the oldest and best firms in Sydney. He was chairman of directors of a flourishing company, and he was an MLA, with three hundred a year for pocket money. Surely such a man could not be in want of money. Yet Herbert Golding required money, and a large sum. Dr Langside had not been satisfied in going through the books of Bryce Golding and Company. There was a sum of close upon thirty thousand pounds he could not satisfactorily account for. Herbert Golding explained that the sum was advanced him by the late Mr. Bryce for certain purposes connected with the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. In fact, the thirty thousand was for the purpose of extending the operations of that company. He acknowledged the late Mr. Bryce was not a shareholder in the company, but, he said, the advance was fully secured on property held by the company. Edward Bryce had accepted this explanation without giving the matter much thought, but on consideration he had empowered Dr. Langside to act for him in the matter during his absence, and go thoroughly into particulars with Herbert Golding. Dr. Langside requested Herbert Golding to furnish him with full particulars as to this advance of £30,000.
this herbert golding had not yet done and the doctor was becoming impatient at last to allay his suspicions herbert golding had promised to refund the whole of the money within twelve months he said the company was flourishing and could in that time easily pay back such a sum the money has been taken out of the firm said dr langside and there is no proof that mr bryce empowered you to act in this manner i have no doubt your statement is correct you are one of the executors and i am acting for mr edward bryce and am also myself an executor and i am sure mr golding you will see it is to the interests of the firm this money should be put into the business again times are not so good now as they were formerly and even to a firm such as bryce and golding thirty thousand is a sum of vast importance i thoroughly agree with you dr langside said herbert golding my partner trusted me in everything in the matter of the advance to the company he knew i was chairman of directors and therefore in a position to know how it stood financially i candidly admit at the time mr bryce agreed to allow the money to be drawn out the company was not in such a good position as it stands to-day as to the mortgages they are all in proper order and you can see them if you wish as executor i should like to see them said dr langside they were not with mr bryce's papers no said herbert golding as it was purely a matter of transferring the money from one business to another business mr bryce kept his papers in the office i will show you them said herbert golding as he opened a safe and took some papers out handing them to dr langside dr langside examined them carefully they looked all right but he had his suspicions he disliked herbert golding but that did not influence him and he had no wish to be unfair to him in consequence he would have liked to take the papers to his solicitor but as herbert golding was one of the executors he did not feel inclined to adopt this course the papers will be perfectly safe here he said as he gave them back to herbert golding who locked them in the safe again after further conversation herbert golding had agreed to the money being repaid into the firm by the land company within twelve months and with this promise dr langside expressed himself satisfied herbert golding had secured an advance of thirty thousand pounds from the firm of bryce golding and company and he had placed the bulk of the money at the disposal of the amalgamated land investment company because at the time he did so he had every faith in the company and was sanguine he would clear a large sum by using this money how he obtained henry bryce's consent to the advance of this large sum or whether henry bryce knew it had been advanced was at present only known to herbert golding dr langside had his suspicions but he said nothing he was a medical man and could keep his own counsel in the course of an extensive medical practice dr langside had some curious family secrets committed to him they were as safe with him as though the recipient of them had died and had them buried with him he was not a man to talk about other people's affairs he could not however help knowing what had been told him and curiously enough when attending a director of the very company herbert golding was chairman of he had listened to a statement that did not redound to that gentleman's credit this particular director had an idea at the time he was about to die but he recovered when he regained his health he was in a fever of anxiety when he thought of all he had said to dr langside in a casual way suppressing his anxiety as well as he was able he alluded to what he had stated to dr langside the doctor looked at him steadily and replied my dear sir i never take notice of what my patients say when they are delirious or not quite in their right senses i hear what they say but it is my invariable rule to forget it afterwards quite right doctor quite right was the reply you are a model of discretion i wish there were more men like you let me give you a word of advice said dr langside with a smile do not make any more confessions before you are quite certain you are going to die herbert golding was thinking over this thirty thousand pounds as he drove to see mrs bryce he determined if he saw no other way clear to marry her and invest the bulk of her money for her in the amalgamated lands investment company in other words 
pay by means of her money the thirty thousand back into the sound firm of henry bryce golding and company that would relieve him of one grave responsibility but there was a far more important and all disastrous one looming ahead herbert golding was not a fool he was a calculating hypocritical rogue with the manners of a gentleman and a smooth-faced look that disarmed suspicion in most people he above all the directors knew the exact position of the amalgamated land and investment company the other directors were mere puppets and herbert golding's advice was always followed the responsibility rested upon herbert golding but the other directors in neglecting their duties and implicitly trusting their chairman would be held equally responsible should anything go wrong herbert golding's thoughts were not pleasant as he drove to mrs bryce's residence he knew perfectly well that the amalgamated land and investment company was not in a flourishing condition and he was also aware that the last dividend had been paid out of money recently deposited End of chapter 13「Mrs. Bryce accepts " Of course, I am aware the wedding could not take place for some months," said Herbert Golding to Mrs. Bryce. "But my dear Lydia, that need not stand in the way of our engagement. I want to feel that you are mine and mine only. If you prefer it, we can keep our engagement a secret until you think proper to disclose it. But give me a decided answer, Lydia. This suspense is intolerable, and I can bear it no longer. My love for you must plead in excuse for me, and if you love me as I love you, I am sure you will consent. Thus spoke Herbert Golding to Mrs. Bryce, and he did not speak in vain. Mrs. Bryce meant to accept his offer all the time, but she wished to keep him in suspense for a few moments. She declared her love for him, and accepted him as her future husband, but she wished the engagement to be kept secret, and would not agree to the marriage taking place until twelve months had elapsed since Mr. Bryce's death. This suited Herbert Golding exactly. He was not in a hurry to enter the bonds of matrimony. He fancied he could handle Mrs. Bryce to his own complete satisfaction. They chatted pleasantly and in a confidential manner. Herbert Golding knew better than to carry his profession of affection for her too far, but he flattered Mrs. Bryce and fooled her easily. Money matters cropped up. Herbert Golding had skilfully introduced the meeting held at the land company's office into the conversation. He knew Mrs. Bryce would be pleased to hear of the presentation to be made him, and accordingly he made the most of it, and also of the company over which he presided. "'It must be a very flourishing concern,' said Mrs. Bryce. Ten per cent for deposits is really a wonderful interest.' "'It is,' said Herbert Golding. "'I had better strike while the iron is heated in the fire of love, and before it cools down,' he thought." "'I'm afraid you will not receive ten per cent for your money as it is at present invested,' he said. "'Oh, dear, no, Herbert,' she replied, lingering over his name fondly. "'I only wish I could obtain ten per cent. What a difference it would make in my income!' "'There is no reason why you should not avail yourself of the opportunity to place your money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company,' he replied. "'I am chairman of directors, as you're aware, Lydia, and therefore know how thoroughly safe the bank is.' I am also, as one of Mr. Bryce's executors, bound to do the best I can for you in investing your money. And to be selfish, Lydia, as your future husband, I should take very good care your money was not risked in any foolish speculation. It was a specious argument, and Mrs. Bryce felt the force of it. Even had she been suspicious, which she was not, the fact that Herbert Golding was engaged to her would have disarmed her suspicion. Her future husband would not be likely to rashly risk her money. He gave her time to think over all he had said. "'Have you much money invested in the company?' she asked. "'The bulk of my money is, of course, in the firm,' said Herbert Golding. "'But I have about fifteen thousand in the company in shares, none on fixed deposit.' "'But shares are more risky than deposits,' said Mrs. Bryce. 
"'Depositors are paid in full before shareholders can claim a penny,' said Herbert Golding. "'But I can assure you there is no possible risk, "'or I should not lend my name as chairman of directors, "'or have fifteen thousand pounds worth of shares to my name.' "'I should like to get ten per cent,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'You could invest some of my money in the company for me.' "'I should advise you to place it in the bank on deposit,' he said. "'It is less trouble, and of course safer, "'and ladies always like to be on the safe side in such matters.' "'And quite right, too,' said Mrs. Bryce. "'How much should you advise me to deposit?' "'Do you ask me that question as your future husband, "'or as chairman of directors?' he said. "'As my future husband, Herbert. "'The fact of you being chairman of directors "'only makes your advice the more valuable,' she replied. "'I wonder how much he'll venture,' thought Herbert Golding. "'I'll make a plunge for it. "'As your future husband, Lydia,' he said, "'and wishing to give you the benefit of my advice and experience, "'I advise you to place the bulk of your money in the bank "'on fixed deposit for twelve months. "'If at the end of that time I, in my position as chairman of directors, "'see any cause to recommend you to withdraw the whole or any part of the money, "'I will advise you to do so.' She did not look startled at what he had said, and Herbert Golding felt sanguine of success. "'As you say,' she replied, "'the deposit could be for twelve months, and by that time you would be my husband. I should prefer to keep some money invested elsewhere, say ten or twenty thousand. The remainder could be placed in your bank on fixed deposit.' "'Lydia,' he said, with well-feigned emotion, "'you have indeed made me a happy man. You have shown you not only love me, but that you have unbounded confidence in me it is very good of you i shall never forget it he stooped over and kissed her tenderly mrs bryce was in a heaven of delight at that moment she would willingly have entrusted herbert golding with the whole of her fortune i should not love you as i do if i had not confidence in you she said if you are happy herbert so am i very happy indeed poor henry bryce it is to be hoped, for his own sake, he had not departed to a place from whence he could witness this scene, and hear his newly made widow confess her love for another man. Before Herbert Golding left Mrs. Bryce, she had given him full authority to invest £30,000 in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. His next step was to inform Dr. Langside, in case he should hear of it elsewhere, of what had taken place of course mrs bryce can do as she pleases he said the money is absolutely her own as one of the executors however i shall inform her i do not think she is acting wisely and why pray said herbert golding have you any reasonable objection to advance against the company i have the honour to occupy a prominent position in no said dr langside except he hesitated well said herbert golding except the fact that ten per cent on fixed deposits is rather too good to last long said dr langside i need not have informed you of this matter at all said herbert golding but as you were one of the executors i thought it only a matter of courtesy i should do so i have also written to edward bryce on the subject as to the percentage i grant it is exceptional interest but the company is itself an exceptionally fortunate one and our speculations have all turned out well. Mrs. Bryce will only deposit her money for twelve months. If at the end of that time she wishes to do so, she can withdraw the whole or any portion of it. Dr. Langside was not satisfied. He felt there was more behind this than he had been told. He thought the matter over, and came to the conclusion it would be better for Edward Bryce to allude to the subject to his stepmother. He received a letter from Edward Bryce, asking his opinion, which he gave candidly, and it coincided with Edward's view of the matter. Edward Bryce then wrote to Mrs. Bryce in a polite way, stating he had heard from Mr. Golding that she intended placing the bulk of her money in the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. He advised her to consider well before she took this step. He urged her not to trust a large sum to any banking company of this description. He did not allude to Mr. Golding in any way, except to mention the fact that he had heard from him. The letter concluded with a message from Ida and Flora. Mrs. Bryce smiled when she read her stepson's letter. 
how young and inexperienced he is she thought but he does not know all he does not know herbert is my intended husband there is no necessity to inform him of our engagement yet when he does know of it he will see matters in a very different light i can trust herbert implicitly even a bad man would not recklessly throw away his intended wife's money and herbert is such a good fellow and bears such a high character so it came about that mrs bryce through herbert golding placed thirty thousand pounds at fixed deposit in the amalgamated land and investment bank she duly received a proper acknowledgment of the same and was perfectly satisfied with herself and herbert golding herbert golding had managed this little transaction on his own account he had given his brother directors very little information on the subject but he had frightened them into agreeing that the deposit of thirty thousand pounds should go to pay back the money obtained from bryce golding and company he had explained to them clearly that if this amount was not replaced to the firm there would be an unpleasant exposure when he mentioned dr langside's name the director the doctor had attended during his illness almost dropped out of his chair with fright he at once strongly supported all herbert golding said as a rule he was the only director who occasionally put his foot down when the chairman became arbitrary and herbert golding was pleased at the somewhat unexpected assistance received from this quarter when asked how the large deposit was to be refunded to mrs bryce at the end of twelve months he smiled and hinted they need have no fear on that score as by that time he might stand in a much nearer relation to mrs bryce of course he mentioned this matter privately in order to allay their fears herbert golding felt a different man since mrs bryce had made him her confidant in all things he took good care the money she had placed in the bank was secure and in a short time he meant to transfer it over to bryce golding and company or rather to edward bryce as the money was lent by henry bryce personally the money had been so herbert golding said taken out of the firm but only on henry bryce's account after these transactions herbert golding was more assiduous than ever in attending to the wants of his vicar he worked hard and spared no trouble to make a still further good impression on the parson and he succeeded the vicar was a most respectable advertisement for the amalgamated land and investment company although he was unaware of it the good harmless man trumpeted forth the virtues of herbert golding m l a far and wide he held him up as a paragon of perfection he even went so far as to deposit a thousand pounds devoted to the church building fund over which he had sole control in the amalgamated land and investment bank many persons in his congregation followed suit and the directors of the bank and company wondered at herbert golding's audacity when some spiteful individual hinted in the house that these land banks were not legitimate banks and did not transact their business in a legitimate banking way herbert golding replied to him and crushed him he pointed out how the honourable member in question was a director of a bank that only paid a miserable interest on deposits and that in consequence the bank the honourable member was connected with suffered in the competition he went so far as to advise the honourable member to invest some of the uninvested funds of the bank he was connected with in the amalgamated land and investment company then said herbert golding you may have a chance of placing your bank on an equality with the newer and more enterprising institution such as the one i am proud to be connected with this was too much for the honourable member who left the chamber and was discovered later on in the refreshment room drowning his exasperated feelings in malt liquor mrs bryce read herbert golding's speech he marked it in blue chalk and had it sent to her it increased her estimate of her future spouse considerably herbert golding was in fact becoming so exalted on all sides that he actually commenced to believe the good things said and written about him were true End of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen 
of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. At Munda again. The shearing progressed rapidly, and but little inconvenience was experienced by the action of the Unionists. Most of the men in the Union camp commenced to see the folly of holding out longer, and several went over and joined the men at work. Wyndham Hanworth was delighted at the busy scene, and much interested in the picture he was painting, which he intended to call Shearing Time on Munda Station. When Edward Bryce received Herbert Golding's letter, he was much annoyed. He thought it an absurd thing for Mrs. Bryce to invest the bulk of her money in this bank. He had no doubt it was Herbert Golding's influence that had induced her to do so. Ida Bryce said, "'I'm not at all surprised, Ted. You do not know Mrs. Bryce as well as I do. Would you like to have my candid opinion?' "'Most certainly,' replied her brother. "'Your opinions are generally candid, I know.' then my opinion is that herbert golding has proposed to mrs bryce and been accepted and in consequence of this she has placed her money in the bank of which he is chairman of directors proposed to mrs bryce said ted indignantly you're mistaken ida remember our father has been dead only a few weeks i do remember said ida passionately and that is why i have such a dislike to mrs bryce she actually permitted herbert golding to pay his attentions to her before i left for munda i feel certain she's accepted him but i have no doubt the engagement will be kept secret for some time it would not suit herbert golding's plans to have the engagement made public he's such a saintly man edward bryce felt inclined to write a severe letter to mrs bryce but after taking wyndham hanworth's advice he decided merely to ask her to be cautious and strongly urged her not to deposit such a large sum of money with the Amalgamated Land and Investment Company. A day or two after Edward Bryce received his letter from Herbert Golding, Wyndham Hanworth had one from the Honourable Secretary of the Herbert Golding Presentation Committee, commissioning him to paint a portrait of Herbert Golding. The artist was considerably surprised at this request. He had, it was true, shown considerable ability in portrait painting, but unlike many artists, he modestly underrated his powers in that line. Edward Bryce advised him to accept the commission. "'What a curious coincidence,' said Ida Bryce, "'that you should be asked to paint Mr. Golding's picture just at this particular time.' "'It is strange,' said Wyndham. "'I assure you I did not anticipate it. "'I often think portrait painters ought to be good judges of character,' said Ida." "'I'm afraid I cannot claim to be a very good judge of character,' said Wyndham. "'And yet, when I've been painting a portrait, "'I have sometimes fancied I could read my subject's thoughts, "'and almost unconsciously they influence me "'in the expression of the face in the picture. "'Do you think it would be possible to paint a person "'so that from the expression in the face, "'the subject, upon looking at the portrait, "'would see his or her own mind and thoughts expressed in the face?' asked Ida. Wyndham Hanworth paused for a few moments before replying. Then he said, "'I understand what you mean, Miss Bryce. It would be possible, I think. I fancy I could do it myself, but if I painted portraits on that principle, I am afraid my commissions would be few and far between.' "'Why?' asked Ida. "'They would be truthful portraits, then.' "'Too truthful,' said Wyndham. "'If you saw some of the originals of the portraits at the Royal Academy, or in the Sydney Art Gallery, as I have, you would know what i mean that the paintings are more charming than the originals i can well believe that said ida i once knew a fashionable society lady said wyndham who had her portraits painted by an eminent artist it was an admirable likeness true to nature she declined to accept it her excuse was that it might resemble her but she wanted an artistic picture not a painted likeness when asked what she meant she explained that a portrait when painted ought to be artistic in the same sense of the word as the original of the portrait was artistic after undergoing her toilet in other words laughed ida that the portrait should be touched up like the original exactly said wyndham smiling he thought a portrait of ida bryce would not require much touching up it would take a clever artist to do justice to the delicate, healthy tints on her face. 
Wyndham Hanworth accepted the commission to paint Herbert Golding's portrait. From what he knew and had heard of Herbert Golding, he thought that gentleman's mind would form an interesting study during the process of painting. Ida Bryce and Flora had been three weeks at Munda, and it was decided they should return to Sydney with Wyndham Hanworth. The day before they were to leave, Ted Bryce said to Wyndham, I wish the girls were safely out of the way. Wide Awake has heard from one of the union men, now shearing in the shed, that Bully Spence and a few of the more desperate men are bent on mischief. The police are here yet, said Wyndham. They will afford sufficient protection in case of any disturbance. The attack, Wide Awake heard, was to be made on the homestead, not on the wool shed. The blackguards no doubt fancy that it will be an easy job to set fire to this place. I wish I knew what night they were coming. We could give them a warm reception. They would never have the audacity to fire the homestead, said Wyndham in surprise. My dear Wynne, these men would have the audacity to set Darlinghurst Jail on fire if they thought there would not be much risk attending it. It's their own precious skins they're frightened about. Later on in the day, Wide Awake came to the homestead and told Edward Bryce that several of the Union men, including Spence, had left the camp, but it was not known in which direction they had gone. "'I think you would act wisely to have three or four of the police here tonight,' said Wide Awake. "'I can ride over and ask Sergeant Tyler to send them.' "'If we had no ladies here,' said Ted, "'I would not send for them. Nothing would give me greater pleasure than to come to close quarters with a few of these scoundrels. Will they have firearms, do you think, Wide Awake?' "'Sure to have some revolvers among them,' he replied. "'If they've been drinking at Dame Killam's pub, they'll not stick at a trifle.' "'Then you can ride over to Sergeant Tyler and ask him to send four men,' said Ted. Dame Killam, alluded to by Wide Awake, was a noted character out west. Her real name was Mrs. Warden, and she kept a lonely bus shanty near Munda, known as the Kangaroo. The shearers said it was called the Kangaroo, because so many men got the jumps there. Dame Killam, or Mrs. Warden, had buried three husbands, slain by the mighty potency of their own grog, it was said, and was on the lookout for a fourth. She had made a bold bid for Wide Awake, but he resisted her charms, which he thought were about on a par with her grog. Eli Spence and his mates, as Wide Awake anticipated, called at the kangaroo in order to prime themselves for the work of the night. Mrs. Warden knew they were a bad lot and up to no good, but that was none of her business. Her particular business was to get rid of as much bad grog as possible at a ruinous price. The more disreputable her customers, the more grog she sold. Eli Spence was a big hulking fellow, and Mrs. Warden thought him a fine man. Eli flattered her and drank her grog and ran up a score. There were seven men at the kangaroo, and they were drinking heavily. Eli Spence had taken enough fiery white spirit to make him a beast in his madness. "'Fear up, name kill him, shouted one of Eli's followers. It must be off before long. Perhaps when you address the lady by her proper name, she'll attend to you, said Eli Spence, with a wink at the man. Mrs. Warden gave him a look, supposed to be languishing, and proceeded to serve out another dose of poison. As Wide Awake rode towards the sheds, he thought he would go near the kangaroo and see if his surmise was correct. It was a rash thing to do but he was a man who was not afraid of danger. The inn was only a mile or so out of his way, and it would not take him long to reach there. If he saw anything of the men, he could ride on and give information, and Sergeant Tyler could have the gang arrested on suspicion before they left the kangaroo. Unfortunately, the house was in open ground, and no one could approach it without being seen. Eli Spence happened to look out of the window, and saw Wide Awake riding in the direction of the inn. He gave a savage laugh, and turning to his mate, said, "'Here's a lark. Wide Awake's coming. We'll nab him.' "'Our violence, please, Mr. Spence,' said Mrs. Warden. "'Ah, oh, no, we'll only tie him up for a few hours. He's on his way from the sheds to the homestead. It'll be one less there if we catch him,' he whispered. 
From the direction in which Wide Awake was riding, it was impossible to tell where he had come from. "'We must hide, lads,' said Eli. "'Or rather, you must. I'll stay here. Go out the back door and don't come out, and don't come until I shout for you.' The men quickly slipped out of the house, and Eli stood looking out at the window. As Wide Awake drew nearer, he sat down in a corner out of sight. Wide Awake, seeing no one about, and hearing no sounds of revel, thought he must have been mistaken, and that the men had not called at the kangaroo. He rode up to the door, and dismounting, looked in. At first he did not see Eli Spence. "'Good day, Mrs. Warden. Not many visitors about.' She merely nodded to him, and said, "'How are you? You're a stranger here.' She had no love for Wide Awake, because he declined to listen to the voice of the charmer. Eli Spence jumped up and said, "'I'm here at any rate.' Wide Awake turned round, and seeing Eli, at once suspected other men were about, that they had seen him coming, and he had fallen into an ambush. He made for the horse, but Eli Spence was too quick for him, and caught him by the collar. Wide Awake wrenched himself free, and Spence shouted, "'Come on, boys!' The men rushed round from the back, and before Wide Awake could mount, they had him on the ground and at their mercy. Mrs. Warden rushed out. "'I have no violence done here,' she said, in order to clear herself in Wide Awake's eyes. "'They'll not hurt him, dame,' said one of the men. "'What do you want with me?' asked Wide Awake. "'You'll suffer for this, Eli Spence.' "'Shut up, and you'll be made to,' said Eli. They tied his hands and feet, and carried him into a stable. Then, throwing him down on some straw, they left him. Wide Awake's hands were tied behind him in a hard knot. His meditations were not pleasant. He must get away from this place by some means, or Sergeant Tyler would receive no warning, and Eli Spence and his accomplices would find the homestead unguarded. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Who Did It by Nat Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Attack on the Homestead By a lucky chance, Wide Awake's horse managed to slip his bridle, and when he saw the scuffle going on, he galloped off. The horse is gone, said Eli Spence. Curse it! The brute is sure to go straight home, and I wonder what has become of his rider. "'Perhaps they'll send and search for him,' said one of the band. "'Sure to,' said Eli Spence. "'All oh, the better if they do. "'There'll be fewer men at the homestead, and we can hurry up.' The seven men marched off and moved in the direction of Munda. Four of them, including Eli Spence, were armed with revolvers, and the remainder carried heavy waddies. They also had inflammable material to be used in setting fire to the house and buildings. Wide Awake heard them try the door of the stable, and the key was taken out by Eli Spence, who said, I'll keep this in my pocket for luck. For fully an hour, Wide Awake tugged at his bonds. He wriggled himself down to the door, and on the ground he felt a piece of old iron which was worn sharp. He twisted about until he got his hands on it, and then he managed to fix it against the side of the stable, so that he could rub the rope against the sharp edge. It was a slow process, but he managed in time to saw it through. He freed his wrists from the rope, and saw they were much swollen. Quickly he cut the rope that bound his legs with his knife, and then got on to his feet. He felt stiff and sore, but he knew that it would work off. The door was fast, and he could not open it. He went up into the small loft above, and there found a door which was easily unfastened. He looked out. The distance was not great from the ground, so he dropped down. When he ran round to the front, he saw his horse was gone. Eli Spence has taken him, he thought. When Mrs. Warden saw him, she gave a faint shriek. Law, oh, how you frightened me, she said. Why did you not let me out? asked Wide Awake angrily. 
Eli Spence has the key in his pocket, she replied. Then you should have ordered your man to burst open the door. I'm afraid you will get into trouble over this job, Mrs. Warden, he said. I had nothing to do with it, she replied. What could I do against seven men? You could not do much against seven men, replied Wide Awake. But when they were gone, you need not have assisted them by detaining me here. Do you know what devil's mischief that brute Eli Spence is up to? No, said Mrs. Warden. I don't want to know. But let me tell you that Eli Spence is no more of a brute than you are. We'll not argue that point, said Wide Awake. I'm satisfied as to what he is, because I had the pleasure of thrashing him not so very long ago. You, said Mrs. Warden with contempt. Eli Spence would lick half a dozen whippersnappers such as you are. On this particular occasion he failed to lick me, as you call it, said Wide Awake. To show you the sort of men you encourage about here, let me tell you, Eli Spence and his mates are going to fire him under Olmstead. Mrs. Warden started. She did not care to be mixed up in a serious affair of this kind. Not them, she said. You're piling on the agony at any rate. I've told you the truth. I was on my way to the shed and came round to see where the men were. I fancied they would call here. Sure enough, they trapped me, and now I have to make up for lost time. They've taken my horse, so I want the best you have in the stable, and quick. It may be too late, but if I start at once, Sergeant Tyler may be warned in time. I have no horse to lend you, said Mrs. Warden. Yes, you have, said Wide Awake. There's one in the next shed to the hole I was put into. If you do not lend me that horse, I shall have to take it. If I tell Sergeant Tyler all I know about your place, you'll not be here long. Let me have the horse, and I'll shield you as much as I can. Mrs. Warden saw there was nothing for it but to comply with his request, so she reluctantly consented, saying it was a hard thing when a lone widow was bullied in this fashion. Wide Awake quickly saddled the horse, and mounting, at once dashed off at a gallop, merely waving his hand to Mrs. Warden and saying, "'I return horse!' Hey, "'He's a cool un, she muttered. "'Fancy him giving Eli Spence a hiding. "'I didn't think he had it in him. "'I wish he'd take a fancy to me. "'I've given him plenty of encouragement, "'but he isn't a marrying sort.' Wide Awake rode as fast as his horse would go to the shed. It was late when he reached there, and when he related what had happened to Sergeant Tyler, the constable said, We must start at once. I hope I shall not be too late. I shall take half a dozen men and go myself. I should like to take the whole gang red-handed. That Eli Spence is a bad lot. I have received information about him from Sydney, only this morning that may prove interesting to Mr. Bryce. Wide Awake's horse was done for, so he took one belonging to a boundary rider that happened to be handy. The police and Wide Awake were soon on the way to Munda, and Sergeant Tyler was determined there should be no delay on the road. At Munda they were all satisfied Wide Awake had safely reached the shed, and that the police would arrive in good time. "'I hate sending for the constables,' said Ted to Wyndham. "'but I think it's only right, as the girls are here.' "'Much better to be on the safe side,' said Wyndham. "'What ruffians these fellows must be! "'Do you think Wide Awake's information is correct?' "'I've not much doubt about it,' said Ted Bryce. "'When he tells a story, it's generally founded on fact.' "'The hours went by, and no police arrived. "'A clattering of horses' hoofs was heard, "'and Ted Bryce, going on to the veranda, saw Wide Awake's riderless horse galloping to the homestead. "'Here's a go,' said Ted. "'Something's gone wrong with Wide Awake. "'Here's his horse with no bridle on. "'What on earth can have become of him?' "'Perhaps he's been trapped by the shearers,' said Wyndham. "'By Jove, I have it,' said Ted. "'He's been round by the kangaroo.' "'The what?' asked Wyndham. "'I forgot you did not know the kangaroo,' said Ted. "'That is the name of Dame Killam's shanty.' He had an idea Spence and his mates would be there, and he may have gone round to make certain. It was a risky thing to do. I hope he has come to no harm. That Eli Spence is a dangerous man, and he owes Wide Awake one for the thrashing he received from him. If it is as you surmise, said Wyndham, 
the police will not have received information and we shall be at the mercy of these men they'll get a warmer reception than they expect if i can lay hands on them said ted bryce the only danger is in fire this place will burn like tinder i'll send off another man at once to tyler edward bryce thought it best to tell his sister and flora all that had happened and he was glad to see how coolly they took it what can we do to help you said ida i should like to have a shot at one of them ted i think i could hit a man he's a fair-sized mark at any rate but you would not like to kill a man said flora they're not men said ida they're brutes and must be dealt with as such every precaution was taken at the homestead and all the buildings were watched in addition to edward bryce and wyndham hanworth there were two men and several lads about as the evening wore on and there were no signs of the men about edward bryce commenced to think that after all wide awake might have been mistaken ted and wyndham hanworth had loaded the guns in case they were wanted and also had a revolver each handy a bullet or two will give them a fright said ted i don't want to kill anyone but i'm not going to have my place fired if i can help it eli spence and his men kept away from the homestead until it was dark and then commenced to draw nearer it was agreed to fire the outbuildings first and then in the confusion make a rush for the house they were unaware that edward bryce had received warning of their attack or they would have altered their tactics considerably eli spence calculated upon finding the outbuildings deserted and those in the house off their guard we can't delay much longer said eli there's lights in the house yet better wait until they're put out said one of the men the night wore on and edward bryce thinking if the men were about they would not care to come too near while the lamps were burning kept them lighted eli spence at last lost his patience and said we'll try and fire some of the outbuildings anyhow come on mates you know what to do they crept into the enclosure and silently stole to the buildings luck seemed to favour them for the building eli spence decided to fire first was unguarded in a very short time the crackling of burning wood could be heard the men at the homestead were on the alert in an instant but eli spence and his mates were powerful men they quickly silenced two of the men with heavy blows on their heads and the lads seeing such a large number of men arrayed against them ran towards the house ted bryce heard the row and he and wyndham at once went on to the veranda they're villains they fired one building said ted wide awake was right after all and a girl safe win yes said wyndham hanworth they are in the room at the far side and it's well protected now lads what is it said ted bryce as the youngsters scrambled on to the veranda blaze mr bryce there's a regular army of em they knocked bill and harry down and now they're coming on here we're ready for them said ted bryce eli spence and his men fired another building and then made a dash for the house if they're armed he said there'll be less risk in rushing right into them here they come said ted as he saw the men rushing across the lawn if you do not halt we shall fire he shouted at the top of his voice no notice was taken of this and as the men neared the veranda both ted bryce and wyndham hanworth fired two of eli spence's men fell but one was quickly on his feet again wyndham hanworth was not a very good shot and the bullet had only grazed him eli spence levelled his revolver at edward bryce and fired ted's revolver dropped out of his hand and he gave a sharp cry of pain he quickly stooped down and picked it up with his left hand fire win fire quickly said ted there over there see that brute trying to fire the place wyndham hanworth fired and the man fell over curse you howled eli spence you shall pay for this someone must have split they knew we were coming he thought to himself the men five in number had managed to reach the veranda edward bryce had been shot in the right arm but he still continued to use his left his aim however was uncertain 
the men came to close quarters and edward bryce called out the girls win go to the girls i'll keep these cowards back wyndham hanworth had not seen ted bryce hit and concluded he was able to hold his own he passed inside and took a couple of breech loaders and went to guard the door of the girls room how many are there asked ida not many said wyndham we shall keep them at bay if they do not fire the place where is mr bryce asked flora on the veranda said wyn alone asked flora yes said her brother then go to him at once said flora we can defend ourselves we have revolvers here go at once said ida we shall be safe here wyndham hanworth ran to the other side of the house as he rushed through the open window onto the veranda he was tripped up and then a violent blow on the head stunned him ted bryce had been knocked down and rendered insensible and the ruffians now made for the girl's room we'll trap these jades and then fire the place said eli spence fire it first said one of the men now we'll get the women out said eli with a hoarse laugh End of chapter 16chapter 17 of who did it by nat gould this librivox recording is in the public domain two brave girls the ruffians rushed from room to room until they came to the locked door which checked them for a few moments they're in here said eli spence open this door he shouted ida bryce said to flora they must have overpowered ted and your brother stand firm flora as soon as they bust the door open fire bridget she said to mrs o'brien take that gun and don't be afraid to use it the men rushed at the door but it did not yield the girls had dragged most of the furniture to the door and piled it up the moment you enter we fire shouted ida we're not afraid of a pack of girls said eli spence there's one or two single men here and they want to get married so you'd better accept their offers ida muttered brutes then held her revolver in readiness the door soon gave way and the men rushed forward stumbling over the furniture eli spence caught his leg in a chair and fell to the floor it saved his life for ida bryce fired straight at him but missed him as he fell fire flora cried ida flora hanworth had never handled a revolver in her life but she was no coward and taking aim at one of the men she pulled the trigger the man gave a howl of pain followed by a volley of oaths he was hit in the shoulder bravo flora cried ida mrs o'brien was not idle she had no wish to kill any of the men so she discharged the gun at the legs of the man next to eli spence he was evidently hit for he limped away and tied a large handkerchief round his wounded limb again ida bryce fired but eli spence who had recovered himself was too quick for her and knocked up her arm at the same time seizing her round the waist ida struck him in the face with her revolver but he did not let go his hold another man seized flora hanworth and mrs o'brien was knocked down in the scuffle ida bryce struggled desperately with eli spence but her strength proved of no avail against the powerful bully she did not cry out but made a desperate resistance the drink the men had taken at the kangaroo made them savage and brutal and they were more like beasts than human beings ida bryce as she looked at eli spence's face saw what she had to fight against and this gave her additional strength you're a beauty said eli struggle away you'll soon tire and there's no one to help you flora hanworth was soon overcome by the man who attacked her and sank on to the floor ida bryce felt her strength was fast giving way and eli spence bent her backwards with all his might she made another desperate effort and then became exhausted carry them out of the house shouted eli and then we'll fire the place he lifted ida in his arms and made for the door he was too late at that moment sergeant tyler and his men rushed into the house and before eli could drop his burden the constable had him by the throat 
"'We're just in time,' he said. "'Eli Spence, you're my prisoner.' "'Am I?' said Eli, wrenching himself free. No sooner did Ida Bryce feel Eli Spence's hold relax and see the constables than her strength returned. As Eli Spence wrenched himself free from Sergeant Tyler, Ida Bryce picked up one of the waddies that had been dropped and dealt him a blow in the face. He staggered back and fell over one of his mates. Sergeant Tyler was on to him in a moment, and pulling out a pair of handcuffs, had Eli Spence fast before he well knew what had happened. The constables soon captured the remainder of the men, and in about ten minutes from their arrival on the scene, Eli Spence and his mates were firmly secured. Leaving a couple of constables to guard them, Sergeant Tyler and his men went in search of Edward Bryce and Wyndham Hanworth. They found them on the veranda, slowly recovering their senses, and wide awake attending to them. Ida Bryce and Flora Hanworth followed. Strange to say, Ida ran to Wyndham and Flora to Ted Bryce. They were neither of them seriously hurt, but felt dazed after the blows they had received. "'What about the buildings?' said Edward Bryce. "'Are they burning still? Is it you, Flora?' he said, as he looked up into her face. "'Yes,' said Flora. "'Are you badly hurt?' "'Soon be all right,' said Ted. "'I've got a nasty knock on the head. Thank God you've escaped those brutes. Where's Ida?' "'She's attending to Wyndham,' said Flora, smiling. "'Then we have changed sisters,' said Ted. "'Yes,' said Flora, with a slight blush. "'I ran to you, and Ida went to Wyndham. "'We had no time to think. "'We went to the assistance of the one nearest to us.' "'Ah,' said Ted, smiling. "'Then if you had considered for a few moments, Flora, "'you would have gone to win. "'Flora did not answer, and Ted Bryce said, "'It was my turn to help you when we chased the phantom. "'Now it is your turn. "'We seem to look after each other well, Flora. "'I hope we shall always be of the same mind.' "'I hope so,' replied Flora. "'Do you feel better now?' "'Can you stand?' "'She helped Ted Bryce to get up, "'but he felt rather shaky on his legs "'and leaned on her slightly. "'His head pained him and he felt faint. "'Flora led him into the house "'and he sank down on the sofa. "'He took both her hands "'and drew her gently towards him. "'She did not resist. "'May I, Flora?' he said, "'looking lovingly into her eyes. "'It is the best medicine I can take.' She could not help herself. She loved him dearly, and Ted Bryce gave her the first kiss of love she had ever known. It startled her, and she drew back. She knew a change had come over her life, and that now Edward Bryce was more to her than anyone in the world. Ida Bryce was a girl of a different stamp to Flora. She roused Wyndham Hanworth, and then packed Mrs. O'Brien off to fetch some brandy and a cloth to tie round his head which was much swollen at the back. "'You must have had a nasty blow,' said Ida. "'But I'll soon put you right. I had a tussle myself with that big hulking brute Spence. He'd almost mastered me, when luckily Sergeant Tyler came to my rescue. The wretch had me in his arms. I could have scratched his eyes out.' "'He dared to touch you,' said Wyndham savagely. "'I should rather think he did,' said Ida. "'The horrid brute held me as tight as a grizzly bear. He hugged me.' and Ida could not repress a shudder at the thought. This roused Wyndham Hanworth thoroughly. "'He ought to be thrashed, the beast. I wish I could have got at him.' "'I wish you had,' said Ida. "'I can assure you he almost squeezed the life out of me.' From the manner in which Wyndham Hanworth looked at her, Ida Bryce fancied he would not object to hold her in his arms. She liked him very much, but Ida Bryce was a girl not so easily won as Flora Hanworth. There was considerably more independence in her disposition. During this time, wide awake, the constables and the hands about the place were working hard to prevent the flames spreading. Two buildings were on fire, but they were fortunately isolated from the remainder, and as it was a still night, the danger of the fire extending was not great. "'These two buildings will go,' said Sergeant Tyler. "'Is there much inside of them?' "'Nah,' said Wideawake. "'Only a lot of chaff and some sacks.' The fire gradually burnt itself out, 
and when sergeant taylor saw the remainder of the buildings were safe he went to inspect his prisoners four of the men were wounded and eli spence had some nasty bruises on his face you've made a mess of it this time spence said sergeant tyler i've managed to take you and your mates red-handed there may be another charge laid against you before long spence eli spence started and said there's no charge to be brought against me that i know of except this job cursed bad luck we had over it too it was lucky for you i happened to reach here in time said tyler significantly what's the other charge growled eli i'm not at liberty to tell you at present said tyler you probably have some idea what it is the prisoners were locked up in an outbuilding and well guarded as sergeant tyler went into the house he met ida bryce you are a brave girl miss bryce he said admiringly and i'm glad to see you look none the worse for your struggle with that blackguard eli spence i am glad i have been able to lay him by the heels he's a dangerous man you were just in time sergeant replied ida bryce i should have been overpowered in a few more minutes my friend miss hanworth also had to defend herself and i can assure you she did it well remarked ida as flora came up then there are two brave girls i'm proud to know said tyler politely ida is much braver than i am said flora how she managed to struggle with that monster of a man surprises me i must confess i do not want to repeat the experiment said ida the two girls retired to try and rest for it had been a night of desperate excitement to them in the dining-room tyler found edward bryce and wyndham hanworth both looking seedy and worn out i hope you are both better said tyler had wide awake not been caught at the kangaroo we should have saved you all this trouble mr bryce i am glad it's no worse and we have had the satisfaction of capturing the whole gang it was foolish of wide awake to run the risk he did said ted but he thought it was for the best it is the gross insults to my sister and miss hanworth that make me savage that unlucky blow stunned me or i am afraid that eli spence would have been sent to another world ere this it is much better that no one has been killed said tyler it will show you acted with great forbearance i am afraid it will be hardly correct to credit us with forbearance sergeant said ted smiling rather put it down to our being bad shots i certainly tried my best to hit my man and i think mr hanworth did the same i did said wyndham but i am more familiar with a brush than a revolver however all's well that ends well and the affair might have been more serious for yourselves it might said tyler but for these men it could not well be more serious and they will deserve all they get i wonder what tom dow will think of it said edward bryce he'll be mad said sergeant tyler dow's not half a bad sort if the men would follow his advice there would never be attacks of this description i don't think any of the union men in camp will feel the loss of eli spence that man is an out-and-out -out scoundrel mr bryce when you have had a rest i have some information i can give you about this man wide awake knows more about him than he cares to say said ted bryce i'll question him said tyler i often wonder who wide awake is the man puzzles me i fancy he's a man suffering unjustly for another person's misdeeds you've hit the right mark said ted bryce but do not give him a hint of what you think or he will keep silent about spence End of chapter seventeen